good to be here. Uh-huh. We're being recorded. I have to click on continue, I guess. Okay. So uh, my topic or the, is the title of a book that I did called uh, Practical Utopia. That's a little bit of a strange title, I suppose. Uh, in these times, these pretty strange times, uh, it would not be surprising to me if some of you are feeling a considerable amount of anger, a considerable amount of fear, a degree of depression. Certainly these uh, emotions and sentiments are quite prevalent among young people in the United States right now. Uh, it isn't just the pandemic, it's the prevalence of um, very visible, very violent racism, of inequality that's growing, of a degree of alienation, and so on. I could spend forever talking about that, but that's not our topic. Um, instead, the, the topic being uh, utopia, there's a, a sort of a, I don't know, a, a, a phrase that's going around in the US now, which is that it's easier for people to to conceive of the end of the world than to conceive of the end of capitalism. That dystopia is actually closer to people's consciousness, closer to people's awareness than utopia. Dystopia is just, you know, horrible, horrendous outcomes. Utopia is the opposite. It's uh, incredibly positive outcomes. And it usually is conceived to be beyond what's possible. So utopian typically means in people's minds something that's really wonderful, but unattainable. And so the title Practical Utopia is that I don't have that in mind at all. I'm concerned to think about something that is indeed uh, wonderful, desirable, something that we want, but that is also practical, that is capable of, of being had. So why do we no need it? Why do we need to be able to enunciate and discuss and make a case for what we'll call a practical utopia, a new society different from the one we have? It seems to me that we need it partly to overcome cynicism, which is incredibly rampant, and that's why it's so easy for people to think about dystopia and not positive outcomes, and partly to orient actions. That is, for those who are aroused by injustices and by uh, inadequacies of current circumstances and who want to do something about it, how do you know what to do unless you know where you want to go? So it's partly to overcome cynicism and move us, and it's partly to orient our actions. Now, I should say before we start that, or before we get any further, that I'm happy to stay on as long as people want to, uh, and that I'm much more into the discussion than the presentation. So I'll make a presentation of uh, one aspect of practical utopia. I'm not going to defend it against criticisms and concerns that naturally arise perfectly reasonably, I'm going to assume uh, that you folks, uh, being debaters after all, will raise concerns that you have and criticisms, won't be bashful about that, um, even things that you think are just outright ridiculous, whatever, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so what should a practical utopia address? Uh, to my way of thinking, it should address basically all the key sides of life in order that we can have some conception of what it is that we want as an alternative way of organizing society. And that would mean it should address political relations, cultural relations, kinship relations, or um, some might call it family, but I think it goes beyond that, but it has to do certainly with uh, uh, generating and nurturing and socializing the next generation and economic relations. And a practical utopia is not a blueprint uh, for two reasons, or well, there are more than two, but I'll provide two right now. Uh, and they are, one, 
that we don't know enough to provide a blueprint. I mean, after all, we're talking about the future. We're talking about an alternative society to what we have, something fundamentally different. And we don't know enough to give that in tremendous detail. Uh, and the second reason is because it's not our place to give it in tremendous detail. It's the situation or the place and the responsibility and the uh, prerogative of future citizens to define the way they are going to live in detail. So what's our task? Our task is to define, to provide the defining relations of, to provide an image of, to provide a vision of a society in which people would be able to do that in which people would be able to control their own lives and determine their own destiny, rather than having it controlled or determined by uh, distant institutions or by small sectors of people and the like. So what we need is a scaffold, not a blueprint. Okay, so how, by way of how to vi generate a vision for practical use, utopia and to do so together, let's consider economics, not because I think economics is more important. I don't particularly believe that many people do, but I don't, even though I'm my background, I guess my major background is in activism and economics. I don't think it is more important, but just because it happens to be the area I spent more time on. So I can speak more reasonably about economics. And I'll run through thinking about and even arriving at a vision for a better economy in place of capitalism, which we currently endure, but without addressing many possible doubts or concerns folks may have. And hopefully you will bring those up in discussion. So to start, we can guide our thinking with some values, uh, but what are our values? In other words, the idea here is if we can enunciate some values, we can judge institutional proposals for a future better economy by whether or not they fulfill those values. And I wanna propose just two for now. In general, I do utilize four or five, but uh, two for now so that we can move toward discussion. The first is self-management. And to me, self-management is about decision-making clearly. And the value that I have in mind is not democracy, which is one person, one vote, majority rules. It's not consensus, which is basically everybody agrees, there's no dissenters, and then a decision is arrived at. Rather, the idea of self-management sort of works itself out like this. Uh, imagine that you, imagine that all of you right now, the 55, 60 people, however many it is that are in this group, were actually a workplace, okay? And one of you is deciding uh, what to wear to work, um, whether to wear, I don't know, uh, blue top or red top. And should that be decided by majority vote? Of course not. Should it be decided by consensus? That's even more ridiculous. In fact, since it affects overwhelmingly yourself, it should be decided by the individual in question, more or less dictatorially, more or less like Stalin, right? The, the, the decision affects you, you make the decision. Now suppose one of you wants to bring a boom box. I hope you all know what that is. Basically a, a big radio that you can carry that plays loud music and you wanna bring it and, and play it in the workplace and you wanna play heavy metal music, very loud music. Okay, so do you now make that decision alone? No, who makes that decision? Well, people who would hear the music because it will affect them. Somebody distant in the workplace or in a separate workplace building, maybe doesn't have any say over it, but the people who would be affected have a say over it. And we've all of a sudden got what philosophers might take, you know, two or three years and six volumes to arrive at. Self-management, meaning people should have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree that they're affected by them to the extent possible. So that's the first value. I want to have an economy which is self-managing, in which people have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree that they're affected by them. And as a second value, uh, with a, a truncated list here that we're gonna use, how about equity? Uh, equity is just a word after all, but what, is, what, what does it mean? Well, what we're talking about now is the distribution of stuff. Uh, how much of the social product does each person in the economy get? And what's the norm 
that determines that. And economists would tell you, economist other than myself was here, he'd say the same thing or should say the same thing, which is that there's only a few plausible norms for that. One is that you get income for what you own, for the property that you own, and that's called profit. And so in that case, Jeff Bezos earns, uh, you know, gargantuan amounts because he owns uh, uh, Amazon. In fact, he earns as much in a day as most of you will earn in many, 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 many years, many, many years, lifetimes in a day. And that's because what's being remunerated is his property or the output of his property. So I'm going to assume and that's not fair with a group that I don't know anything about, but since we only have so much time, I'm going to assume that you'll agree with me that that degree of, of reward, of income to anybody is not the route to a truly desirable uh, society yeah, and economy. And it's also not going to yield, obviously, self-management as well as equity. The next uh, norm is that you get what you can take you actually get what you are able to take by virtue of your bargaining power. We could call that a thug's economy, except you might want to pause before you do that because it too is the prevalent norm in our economy. That is, in modern capitalist uh, um, market economies, the norm that determines how much you get is overwhelmingly e either property or bargaining power, and actually property because it conveys bargaining power. And so actually, if you have more bargaining power, you get more income. If you have less, you get less income. Could be that you have more bargaining power because you're part of a group that is, for reasons that go beyond the economy, uh, diminished in power due to racism or sexism. It could be that you have more bargaining power because you have a union and somebody else doesn't. It could be that you have more bargaining power because you have uh, certain attributes in the workplace, which gives you bargaining power in negotiations. All right. I'm going to assume also that we don't want a thug's economy. At least I don't. And you'll be tracking the way I'm generating a, a, a vision. The next uh, possible norm is actually widely held, including by many socialists, although not by me. And this is that people should get as an income back from society. Income, after all, is a claim on the social product, right? We each get an income, it's sort of a budget. It's the amount of the social product that we're able to get back for our income. And uh, so this norm is that you should get back an income that which you contribute to society. If you make bicycles, you don't get bicycles back, but you get an equivalent to the amount of bicycles that you output, that you produce. And likewise, if you produce something else. And many people think this makes sense, that we should get income in this manner. If we contribute to the total social product, a certain amount, that's the amount or proportional to the amount, that amount that we should get back. Uh, I don't think that for a number of reasons. I'll just summarize a couple. Um, I, I guess you're all in Europe. You might not know American uh, sports stars, although I think maybe LeBron James, you know, or, you know, Michael Jordan in the past, or, you know, uh, a soccer star, somebody who's earning, let's say, 20, 30 or 40 million dollars a year. And we ask, is their income appropriate? And most people say, no, it's too much. It's not going to yield a good economy if people can earn that kind of income. But the fact is they're getting less than the amount that they contribute to the social product. Now that might come as a bit of a shock, but the public likes to watch LeBron James play basketball so much that his doing so is contributing a tremendous amount to the overall social product. And he gets back less than that amount. Think about it for a second. Why? Because he doesn't have enough bargaining power to get it all. Nike takes some of it, the owner of the team he plays on takes some of it, various 
the TV channels take some of it. He doesn't get it all because he doesn't have enough bargaining power to take it all. All right. If we dispense with these reasons or these norms for remuneration, what do we believe in? And I'll tell you what I believe in. And, and people will have, some people will have problems with this too, other than different than the problems that I just mentioned with the others. I don't. Uh, I believe that people should get income for how long they work, for how hard they work, and for the onerousness of the conditions at which they work. So you should get more if you work longer, more if you work harder, and more if you work under worse conditions. This does not pertain in any society that any of you live in. Um, largely because if you don't have high bargaining power, you not only don't get high income, but you also work longer, work harder, and work under worse conditions. So the opposite of the norm actually pertains. Those who work longer, harder, and under worse conditions typically get less income, not more, for the same reason, a lack of bargaining power. Okay, so now we have some values. Now how do we go from values to an actual vision for a alternative economy? Well, the first thing we can do is we can immediately see, I think, that you can't have private ownership of productive assets. You can't have people owning workplaces and commanding over them. Why not? Well, if we're serious about the values, if we're serious about self-management, in fact, even if we're serious about democracy, but if we're serious about self-management, you can't have somebody owning a workplace and having dominion over its decisions and the workers having virtually no say at all, basically like a dictatorship. That violates self-management. And you also can't have owners accruing to themselves vast wealth based on their ownership or property. So you have to get rid of private ownership of the means of production. And what we're seeing here is this is what of using values and being serious about them instead of just waving them around, but not taking them seriously, um, moves us in certain directions. If we're serious about these values, and of course, I don't expect that you are instantly, but if you thought it through and you were serious about these values, then they have implications. And the first implication is you have to get rid of private ownership of productive assets. So we're already beyond capitalism. We are already are looking for something that's post-capitalist. Okay, and what's the next step? Well, if we don't have owners making decisions, then who's going to make decisions in workplaces? Who is it that's going to fill that now empty slot of having dominion over the decisions of the workplace? And the answer, of course, is given by the idea of self-management. The workers are going to have a say in decisions in proportional to the degree that they're affected by them. And that means that they are going to need a, a kind of a venue in which they can formulate their desires and their agendas and agitate for them and interact with each other and express and manifest their preferences in proportion to the degree they're affected. And we call that a workers' council. So workers' councils self-manage workplaces. By the same token, consumers' councils operate in neighborhoods around consumption goods. Uh, individuals do that, and so do consumer councils. I'm not going to spend much time on that unless we comes up in questions and discussion. Okay, so now we have what we're calling self-managed councils. And uh, uh, there are problems that arise. Maybe some of you will bring them up. Uh, somebody might say, well, why don't we have the best decision maker making all the decisions? That would be more efficient and effective. So we can talk about them if you bring them up. But I'm going to agitate for, I, I believe in the idea of collective self-management of the workforce all participating in decisions. But now a problem does arise that we have to immediately deal with, I think, which is that if, if we're going to have a workers' council that workers participate in, and it's going to be a viable um, mechanism, then workers have to be prepared to participate. Workers have to be able to participate in decisions and inclined to do so also. And this raises a important issue, 
a very important issue, I think. In capitalist workplaces, we have owners, and we've already done away with that. We also have something called a corporate division of labor. And in a corporate division of labor, people do jobs, and the jobs have tasks that, are, that compose the job, if you will. And that's true in any economy. That's inevitable. Uh, but what's, tip, what's, what's special about a corporate division of labor is that about 20% of the jobs include almost all of the empowering work. So in other words, there's a subset of jobs, about 20%, which have empowering tasks, and another subset, about 80%, that don't. They have disempowering tasks. What does that mean? An empowering task is one that conveys to the person doing it in uh, attributes of empowerment. What is that? Well, information that's relevant to decision making, the inclination to be inclined to decide things, uh, connections to others that are relevant to decision making, um, confidence, energy even. The disempowering jobs are quite the opposite. Those jobs involve rote, repetitive work, work of a sort which actually diminishes your overall knowledge of the workplace, isolates you, work of a sort that reduces your confidence and reduces your social connections to others. So a subset of people is empowered by their work and another subset of people is disempowered by their work and the former will dominate the latter. If you have that, the former will dominate the latter because they have the information, they set the agendas, they have the confidence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll tell you one story, uh, even as we're trying to go quickly. I was in Argentina 20 years ago, roughly, and uh, they had just had a period of worker occupations of factories. So there were literally uh, two, 300 factories in in Argentina that had been occupied by workers because they were they were failing. The factories were not doing well. They were not turning a profit. And the, the owners gave up on them. And the, what I wanna call coordinator class, not working class, not owning class or capitalists, but coordinator class, people who monopolize the empowering tasks. Those people gave up also because they figured once the, once the owners left, it was hopeless, so they should leave too. But the workers wanted to keep the factories going because their livelihood depended on it. And so they did. And they took over the factories and they uh, quickly set up workers' councils and made decisions. And some months after that process got underway, I think it was five or six months, I was there talking to about 50 representatives from such factories. And initially, everybody was very animated and excited and talking to other people from other parts of the country who were occupying their workplaces. Uh, and we went around the room and people were going to tell a bit of their story and their circumstances. And after we got a few along, the animation in the room dissipated. It was like a balloon being busted and things got a bit more sober. And by the time we got to the sixth or seventh person, things were quite depressed. And the reason things were quite depressed was enunciated most clearly by that seventh speaker. And I only let it go that far before I, as the person who was chairing and conducting the meeting intervened. Uh, and that person said, you know, when we took over, the, the leaving managers and engineers and so on, they told us we'd never succeed. They told us there was no way around the way we operated in the past, and we were just crazy, and uh, it would be a failure. And I never thought I would say this, the person said, but I think Margaret Thatcher, and I don't know whether you all know who Margaret Thatcher was, but she was the Prime Minister of uh, Britain, and uh, she is famous for enunciating the slogan, there is no alternative. That is, there is no alternative to capitalism. And this person said, I, I never thought I would say this, but I think Margaret Thatcher may have been right. Maybe there is no alternative to capitalism. 
And the reason was because all the old shit was coming back, was the way he described it. He said, look, we took over. We instituted the Workers' Council. We instituted democracy. We pretty much equalized wages. Uh, not, not exactly what I said we should do, pay for duration, intensity, and onerousness, but, but certainly vastly closer than what was done before. And now it's all the old crap is coming back. It feels alienated again. It's, it's, it's just, and they all were upset. And I intervened and said, um, so you think it's because of human nature or you think it's because maybe of the, of the implications of complicated technology and work relations? And they said, yes. And I said, well, I don't think so. So I have a question for you. When you took over the workplace, did you maintain the job structure as it had been in the past? And they said, well, well, of course we did. I mean, for them, that was sort of like asking, did you retain lunch breaks, right? In other words, yeah, of course we did that. In other words, in the, in the transformed workplace taken over by the workers, they still had somebody doing the finances and somebody managing the, the, the line. And somebody, in other words, they kept the old corporate division of labor. The, the change was that now those coordinator class jobs, those empowered jobs were being done by somebody who before was doing disempowered work. But my claim to them was that it wasn't human nature and it wasn't uh, the, the difficulty of complicated production. It was that they retained the corporate division of labor. And what was happening was the corporate division of labor was dividing them into two classes, the empowered group and the disempowered group. And the empowered group saw itself as superior and the empowered group was taking more income. And so all the old crap was coming back. And this is the lesson here. And for those of you who have some prior broader concerns about politics and have become accustomed or involved with various approaches, what I'm describing is not something unique to that case. It's common to what was called 20th century socialism. So it's common to what happened in the Soviet Union and in China and so on. Uh, the old corporate division of labor was maintained. And as a result, a class division and class rule uh, emerged. So what do you do if you want to get rid of that? In other words, what have we done so far? We have workers and also consumers self-managing councils. And then we have uh, equitable remuneration and we have self-management. And now we have something that I wanna call balanced job complexes. And this is an interesting notion, I think. It's that we should in each workplace, instead of dividing up the work so that a fifth of the workers are empowered and four fifths are disempowered, we should divide up the work so that everybody has a fair share of empowered work so that we all come to the workers council prepared to participate in, in the council goings on we we it isn't that some of us are prepared and some of us aren't some of us are confident and some of us aren't some of us have information and some of us don't it's that we all come comparably empowered and prepared and so we are able to self-manage collectively so the need for self-management led to the need for uh, a new way of organizing work. And I'd call it balanced job complexes. So now we have uh, uh, a, a number of features. I'm just checking the time. We have a number of features of a possible vision. And at the next step in our trajectory, and none of these steps, I don't want you to feel like, uh, you know, I don't think you should be convinced by what I'm saying. I hope only that it opens up possible avenues of thought. Um, and that I do hope that if I was making a fuller presentation and we had much more time and we explored it, you would come to agree, but maybe you wouldn't. Okay. Uh, but uh, the point is here, the idea that what we have is the only possibility is not the case. In any case, the next step in our trajectory 
of trying to move from some just two values, right? And we could have had more, we could have had solidarity, we could have had sustainability, we could have had diversity, could have done more, and it would have helped in the development. But to do it quickly, we just took two values. And we have um, pushed them and pushed their implications. And now we have uh, self managing workers and consumers councils, and we have uh, uh, balanced job complexes, and we have remuneration for how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. And now our next problem is one that's very specifically uh, endemically economic. Um, that is, what about allocation? What is it in society that um, organizes and implements and has people organizing and implementing how much everybody gets, how much how much is produced, how much is consumed, it's called allocation, right? And the economists will now again tell us that there are really only, well, actually economists will tell us there are only two options and a third being a combination of those two. I think that's wrong. But in any case, the economists will tell us, look, we can opt for markets. We can opt for central planning or we can opt for some combination of markets and central planning. And that's it. Well, that's a problem if it's true, because markets and central planning are both abominable mechanisms for allocating economic inputs and outputs in, an, in a society. Um, now we could spend a lot of time on this. I'll go pretty quickly. Um, central planning is the easier of the two to sort of reject on a very simple grounds and then an additional one. The simple grounds is it's central planning. It is a set of people deciding for everyone else. In that sense, it violates self-management. If we're serious about self-management, we already do not want central planning. I mean, if it's the only option, okay, then we'd have to have it and ameliorate the pains that it induces. But if we're serious about self-management, we, we know we don't want it. We know we should try and look for something more. Markets are, are, are more, uh, I don't know how to term it. They're more complex in some sense. Markets are basically buyers and sellers competing. The buyer tries to get ahead. The buyer tries to buy cheap. The seller tries to sell dear. The buyers and sellers each look out for their own circumstances in their interaction. A market isn't the mall. A market isn't places, you know, having places to go to get things. Those are going to exist in any economy. Any economy, you have to get stuff, so there'll be a place to get stuff. In any economy, um, that will exist. Markets aren't prices. Prices are valuations of things, right? So in any economy, there will be either implicitly or explicitly relative values of things. So markets aren't prices. Markets are a particular mechanism which determines what prices will be and then what will be uh, produced and consumed in what quantities. Problems with markets. There are a number of them. One is that it turns us into uh, individualist uh, entities in the worst sense. It makes us atomistic. It makes everybody compete against the whole. Uh, our advantage is sort of zero sum. Um, we gain at other people's loss. So that's one problem. Another problem is that markets, by virtue of there being a buyer and a seller, and an individual buyer and a seller, or a unit, a workplace, uh, production, uh, uh, look out for their own circumstances and those who are affected by the transaction at a distance have no say. So if one of you goes out and buys a car and the car is pollutes, you look at the transaction and, and assess its implications for you. And the seller of the car is, is assessing the, tra the uh, transaction for them. But the people who are gonna breathe the pollution are excluded. And there goes self-management again because they're affected and they have no say. And that's not self-management. Now, there are many other problems with markets and I wanna mention just one. 
I think it's an interesting one. Um, it's, it's the least obvious of all of them. So there are a number of other ones which we aren't talking about, which are rather obvious. And then there's this rather subtle one. Imagine that um, we're a workplace again, and we, like those workers in Argentina, take over the workplace, whether it's because we just take it over or because the owner leaves, doesn't matter. It's ours now, we're working it. Imagine that we create a workers council we institute self-managed decision-making. Sometimes it's one person, one vote. Sometimes it's work teams decide for themselves. Sometimes, there's a lot of different manifestations of it, but we institute it. And on top of that, equitable remuneration. And finally, we also replace the corporate division of labor. So in our workplace, we all are participating energetically in the goings-on of the workplace because we're all comparably empowered and confident. But imagine we work in an economy that's market allocated. So allocation is by markets. Suppose we produce bicycles. There are other bicycle plants. If you think about it, the whole idea of markets is that we compete with those other bicycle plants for market share. And in competing with those other bicycle plants for market share, we have to make certain kinds of decisions. I notice I said we have to make it because if we don't make those kinds of decisions, we lose the competition and we go out of business. And so despite the fact that we're wonderful people and we, we care about our neighbors and we care about ourselves and we care about the consumers, but we realize that if we go out of business, all our caring is worthless because we no longer have a workplace. And so we, make, we, we know we have to make certain decisions. We have to turn off the air conditioning like the other bicycle factories, otherwise we'll spend too much on air conditioning and we won't be able to spend enough on advertising to get market buyers. We can't have the daycare that we wanted to have, too expensive. We can't, we, we have to do speed up. We have to increase the pace at which we work beyond the pace at which it would humanely make sense for us to work. Again, why? Because we're competing. And so, are any of us good at making any of those decisions? Are we good at effectively screwing ourselves? And the answer is no. None of us are going to be inclined to, to hurt ourselves in such a fashion. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to look for some people to hire to do that job in our workplace. And where are we going to look for those people? Well, we're going to look at the place that produces those people, management schools. We're going to go to business schools and management schools. This is in the current society. Or we'd have to, you know, nurture people into becoming folks who are perfectly happy making decisions that oppress other people. And in our case, it's us. So we invite these people in. And we give them an air conditioned office and we give them nice working conditions and we give them a good salary. We inoculate them against the decisions which we then tell them to make, make us competitive. So the idea here is that markets produce the class division, not of owners above everyone else. Markets don't impose that. You can have markets without private ownership. But markets do create the coordinator class, working class division. And so does central planning. Central planning, it's a little more obvious. The central planners are empowered and the people inside the workplaces who the central planners imbue with the power over the workplace and want to negotiate with, they are empowered too. Anyway, at this point, we have a problem with markets, obviously not a full and compelling presentation at all. I hope you understand that. But at least the, 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 the outlines of a, of a critique, and all you have to do is look around modern society to see the results, uh, of markets and of central planning. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to come up with a new allocation system. That's what we have to do. We, we, we have no choice. If we can't do that, 
we'll have to use markets or central planning or a combination and try and guard against their horrible effects. But wouldn't it be nicer if we could have a different allocation system? Not only we don't have to guard against it, but it advances the institutions that we believe in, self-managing councils and equitable remuneration and balanced job complexes. So that's what we do. Uh, we, we think about another feature. We'll call, it centri we'll call it participatory planning. And I'm gonna not teach, uh, uh, treat this in, in great uh, detail either, but the essence of it is relatively simple. We have workers and also consumers councils. And we, have, we want self-management. So that means that somehow our allocation is going to have to be determined by those councils in a self-managing way, expressing their desires, receiving the desires of others and others' responses, and modulating their, act, their, their proposals until the proposals for what to produce and the proposals for what to consume begin to mesh, begin to come into accord in the form of a plan. And so, the planning process, the participatory planning process is one, it doesn't have a center. It doesn't have a top and a bottom. It doesn't have a boundary. It has workers and consumers councils and some agencies to facilitate the process. Uh, and the workers and consumers councils make proposals and hear, so to speak, receive the proposals that others make modulate or moderate their proposals, alter their proposals in light of new information, do this through a number of rounds until they arrive at a participatory plan. Now, you know, if that's possible, it can be done without introducing a new class division and without violating self-management. Moreover, it doesn't uh, uh, violate the income norms of the economy. You can conduct participatory planning such that people's income will be a result of duration, intensity, and onerousness of the work that they do. So if this, if this proves viable, it's certainly going to prove worthy. It's classless. It's self-managing. It's equitable. It also turns out, remember I mentioned that markets create a situation in which people are pitted against one another. Well, it turns out with participatory planning, that too disappears. People actually have uh, incentives and um, actually material reality of advancing together. Uh, our income goes up if the whole average income of the economy goes up. It also goes up if we work longer, harder, or, or con worse conditions, but that doesn't take away from anybody else. And our circumstances are improved if we improve the balanced job complex, basically the average quality of the work that people do, then all of our work, all of our situations improves again. Anyway, um, as fast as that was, I can imagine that you have some questions. After all, it's very different from what we, are experiencing and have experienced all our lives. It's very different even from what um, uh, opponents of capitalism have said in the past that they want. It's called participatory economics. It, uh, you, you probably have, um, have an inclination that, well, maybe balanced job complexes are ethical and maybe they would eliminate this nasty class division between coordinators and workers, but are they doable? And would they entail great losses and impositions um, because people would be having to do a, a mix of empowered and disempowered work instead of some people doing only empowered and some people only disempowered? Wouldn't the ones who were doing only disempowered, wouldn't we lose output from them? That might be a question that people would ask, and people do ask that question. Uh, would equitable remuneration, well, that, maybe that's ethically fine, but would it have sensible economic incentives? Would it generate uh, output or cripple output because the incentives would be counterproductive? Or uh, you might have doubts about how to win. You know, How would anybody actually 
attain this thing, this participatory economics. And if we did vision for other realms of society, participatory society. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever questions arise for you, whether it's a doubt or a concern, whether it's a suggestion or an exploration or a criticism or whatever, uh, fine, don't hold back. Um, I've gone quickly, so we have plenty of time for discussion. And now, now let's use that time uh, and maybe even a little debate. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm not on a clock and I'm happy to discuss with you pretty much as long as you wish. So I thank Mr. Albert firstly for this uh, session. As I told you at the opening ceremony, um, we will um, um, approach the topic of utopia with three keynote speakers on this topic from a very different perspective. And I'm really glad that um, Mr. Albert did, uh, you know, fit in the description we said at the beginning, radical thinker and political activist. So this was now um, this approach that I believe did uh, inspire some questions. And then on Sunday, you are going to get a two totally different approaches on the same topic, but David Estlund on um, through more a philosophical analytical approach and then by Sebastian Mitchell on more um, on an approach that will incorporate philosophy and literature in terms of utopia. However, I don't want to stall any discussion. Um, Michael, I believe that you could read, um, uh, you already have some comments and questions in the chat, you have at least one, um, and you already have uh, some uh, students raising their hands. Um, you may you may try to moderate this by yourself as uh, you said that you want to or willing to, but I'm obviously here to help. Okay, I, I see. Oh, I see. The the ones who raise their hands come to the top. Usually, when I do this and I teach classes and so on, I know people, and so people are much more easygoing. <laughs> All right, so I'll take them in the order I see them. Jonathan Platzbecker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, you repeatedly emphasized self-management as a central demand of yours. Mm -hmm. And you, at the beginning, uh, you criticized uh, institutions and their control over our lives. But I ask myself, are there functions uh, of institutions even in a liberal society? Because can't they give orientation and even meaning to people who are incapable of self-control and maybe feel overwhelmed by your demand? And moreover, um, aren't they necessary to domesticate our, an yeah, our animal instincts? So how do you guarantee that your society dominated by self-control does not end in an absolute chaotic anarchy. Okay. Uh, well, first off, I want, I want to clarify something. I'm not against institutions per se. I'm against institutions which delimit self-management or reduce equity uh, or produce inequity, et cetera, et cetera. Institutions are inevitable. You're correct. You know, that, that's true. That goes without saying. Institutions are basically a set of roles. That, ultimately, <laughs> an institution isn't a building, right? It's not even the people, it's a set of roles that people fill. And uh, if the roles cause us to be worse people, that's bad. If they cause us to be better people, that's good. If the roles cause us to be able to self-manage and to self-manage, that's better, I'm saying. And if they, in fact, impose restraints upon us, that's worse. Okay, so you're... Your concern about self-management, and I bet it would carry over to the idea of balanced jobs also, is that uh, maybe some people aren't good decision makers, right? Or maybe some people aren't, uh, are, are in, disinclined. Uh, well, I think that's certainly true in our society. In our society, 80% uh, is educated before they work and then at work uh, prepared to take orders to obey orders and endure boredom. That's basically what public school systems teach us. The main thing they teach is to endure boredom and take orders, unless you happen to be in the group that's going to be the 20%. And then you might learn some useful skills and information. Anyway, um, you're right. The assumption of this is that people can 
uh, do a good job of, uh, somebody's in the waiting room. People can do a good job of making decisions. Why? Because uh, you might have said expertise is important to decision making, which is true. And therefore, decision making, self managed decision making, should take into account expertise. But we don't give experts control. We, we consult and pay attention to what they are informing us. And then we pay attention to a different sort of expertise. The expertise that is that everybody is the world's foremost expert into their own preferences, right? So I'm the world's foremost expert in my preferences. And Jonathan, you are the world's foremost expert in your preferences. And so paying attention to expertise means we need to pay attention to you when it's time to decide results. But we might need to pay attention to I don't know, uh, you know, somebody else here, Nellie, when it's time to talk about the chemical composition that bears upon a decision because she's a chemist. So the point is self-management is saying that just like democracy is saying that people should participate in decisions. It's just that self-management is going, a, is making it a bit more nuanced, right? We shouldn't all have the same say. Sometimes we're more affected and sometimes we're less affected. The idea that uh, people are incompetent or incapable, uh, yeah, there's a small number of people in society who have some sort of ailment that makes them, you know, unable to participate in decision making. But most people's inadequacy at decision making is a function of uh, training and uh, and basically subordination during most of their life. Uh, somebody else. Uh, I'll I'll keep doing the way I, Rick Wiranga. Yes. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question about how you would combine self-management with, with the justice system, because a justice system is defined um, uh, to restrain uh, criminals. And I would yeah. guess that criminals would just like uh, not take part in the uh, council. So well, I, I, I suppose if a, if a criminal was in the workplace, they would they would be taking part. You wouldn't know that they're, they're a criminal at first. There's two key parts to this, I think. First is, there's nothing about this that says that we should let Hannibal Lecter run free, right? You know, some kind of pathological maniac or criminals, period, right? So there's nothing in this that says that uh, such a person is impinging on other people's self-management. They're violating all sorts of values, and there are additional ones we could put. So I agree with you about that. But there is a second interesting thing to notice. In current societies, criminality pays. You might get caught, right? But it pays. You can accrue wealth to yourself, and then you can spend that wealth, right? And that's, I mean... That's not why somebody maybe, uh, you know, gets drunk and, and physically beats somebody up or rapes somebody or kills somebody. But a significant part of criminality is trying to uh, aggrandize oneself, right? That's very hard to do in a participatory economy. Why? Well, it's because everybody's income, everybody's legitimate income in a participatory economy is a function of duration, intensity, and onerousness of the socially valuable work that they do. And as a result, everybody's income, some can earn a little more and some can earn a little less. Why? Because they work longer or they work harder or they, they have somewhat worse conditions that they work under. But the gap in income is not going to be very huge. In fact, it's going to be quite modest, right? Nobody can work five times as long as the average workday. And so what happens is if you steal and you amassed wealth, which is hard for other reasons too, but if you did do it, you can't enjoy it. Because if you enjoy it, you are revealing that you stole it. Because you can't have that much wealth. So there's a real deterrent to certain kinds of crime built into the system. Not intentionally, it just turned out that way. Uh, so that's interesting. But in any case, uh, I think that the value self-management and the value equity, which would be justice, is the way it would transfer over to the political system. Um, 
diversity, solidarity would still persist, but it would require institutions, political institutions uh, that are different from the ones we have now, uh, which have all sorts of harmful features. There's other features. So if you have a police function, which we would, right? So a good economy would still have a police function. Why? Because there are still going to be violations that have to be dealt with. But notice police would have a balanced job complex. And the income of police would be for duration, intensity, and onerousness. And self-management would mean that police as an institution would be subject also to oversight and, and input from the communities that they were policing. And so you, you, you quickly get a lot of innovations that are in precisely the direction that I think any reasonable person would want to go regarding those features. Let me call on somebody else, but I, I think, again, we, have a, we seem to have a bunch of men who, hmm. uh, and it's hard for me to see. Alina, I hope I'm not. Yeah, we have Alina raising okay. her hand. Yeah. Okay, Alina, go ahead. Okay, um, so I have a bunch of questions. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> like a few. okay. Um, so uh, one of your theories was that you said that you want to involve the entire workforce participating in the work, right? Instead of having a supervisor. Is that what you meant? Like you want well, the entire not workforce? exactly, almost. I want everybody in the workplace to have a balanced job complex, which okay. means instead of my doing well let's take an example if I, in a hospital right the surgeon no longer does only surgery okay and the person who was doing uh cleaning of bedpans or whatever is no longer doing only that in the new hospital people are doing a mix of tasks whose overall impact makes them comparably empowered Okay. And then they're participating in the workers' council and in the overall decision making. Yeah. Um, the thing is that, like, normally what happens is that, um, like, they work harder and, you know, they keep on going up the ladder and they have to keep working harder to get there. But Who it told you that? I just thought that that's what happens because that's like the myth in my family. You just keep working harder, you'll get there. <laughs> like, that's, tell, me, tell me this. Do you think a person who works 50 hours? A week or 60 or 70 hours a week right and is cleaning up and you know doing various rote tasks is working harder or less hard than a manager who works 30 hours a week in an air-conditioned office half the time talking on the phone yeah we had a then Who's I'm working getting... harder the first person right yeah the first person yeah and the first person also gets less income and has no power whatsoever yeah so what's happening is that we, what, we, what economics tells us is the case, you can see in five minutes of thought is not the case. Let me give you another example. Uh, one criticism that some people would make of, of the system, I mean, we're going so fast that it's not fair to you all, but one criticism that people would make is, look, um, you're saying people should be paid for duration, intensity, and onerousness. But if that's true, why would anybody become a surgeon? Right? That's a question that people ask me. They say, nobody will want to become a surgeon if that's true, because they're not going to earn any more than if yeah. they became a cook or whatever, right? Yeah. Now, even if, that's even if we don't pay attention to balanced job complexes which is that the surgeon doesn't only do surgery anymore. And the answer here is, well, let's try it with one of you. Who wants to volunteer for this? Uh, right. Also, um, this... let's imagine that you're just about to get out of high school. Okay. Okay. And you're contemplating whether or not to go to college and then medical school and then become a, um, an intern and then finally become a full-fledged doctor, right? Or whether or not to go into a coal mine. And you can change it if you want from doctor to engineer or to whatever you want on that side and on the other side, something that's rote and repetitive. And let's say that the doctor, the economist tells us that we have to pay the 
the doctor, right, the doctor's salary has to be, you know, $500,000 a year to motivate people to do it. And the coal miner's sa salary can be $50,000 a year, right? And they say that this is appropriate. And now what I wanna ask you when you're getting out of high school, so a coordinator class job, an empowered job or a disempowered and rote job, right? I'm gonna start lowering the salary of the surgical job, okay? And you tell me when you would rather not go to college, go into the coal mine, not go to medical school, go into the coal mine, not become an intern, go into the coal mine and not be a doctor, be in the coal mine for 40 years, right? I'm gonna start lowering the salary, 500, 400, 300, 200, you just interrupt me whenever you would take the coal mining job instead of the surgeon job. 100, 80, 50, uh, you're not sure now, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. At, I have had the same result with every audience I've ever done this with, including people who are pre-med, right? It finally comes down to them asking, how much can I survive on? Because I'm not going into the damn coal mine, right? Yeah. That's literally what they what what it comes down to. And notice what we found is that you actually, if people were free, and people had no constraints on them, like being blocked from twenty percent of all work and therefore only having disempowered work mm -hmm. and having no bargaining power, you'd actually need the incentive to get people to go into the coal mine. Yeah. Why? Because it's more onerous. The duration is longer. And the conditions are worse. That's what you need to pay people for. Those things. You don't need to pay people to express themselves. That's not what you need an incentive for. So this, I mean, we're going fast again. But this sort of makes a point about the reality of economic life. What we're told in every direction is that the reason why engineers and doctors and managers and scientists and on and on earn way more than short order cooks and people cleaning up and so on and so forth is because you have to pay them that or they won't do it. It's total nonsense. It has nothing to do with the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is that 80% are constrained and, and can choose only among the disempowered work. That's what's really going on. Let me give you one more and then I'll, I'll, let me take another question. Anna? Um, my question is, um, I also, in, I'm also interested in biology and in biology for an evolutionary change to come around, every state of the change has to uh, carry some evolutionary advantage. So what, how would, we get from the current system to, to yeah. your system? Okay, now that's obviously a big question, right? And a perfectly fair one. Of course, if this alternative is not worthy, there's no point in thinking about your question, right? I mean, if you, if you don't wanna get there, there's no point in thinking about it. But if it is worthy, then, then your question is the paramount question. And I can't answer it briefly, but I think the answer is basically, uh, uh, we have to form movements, we have to organize, we have to create consciousness of the alternative, and we have to seek it. How did people get rid of slavery? How did people get rid of, or at least dramatically reduce, it hasn't been gotten rid of yet, uh, uh, sexism? How did people, in other words, these things happen because large numbers of people become aware and knowledgeable and organize together and fight for the changes. Not all at once, typically, but in, in a kind of a trajectory of change in which we, we win uh, and we innovate and, and uh, 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 introduce into society new norms, new beliefs, new ideas, and then new institutions on the one hand that we create, or we fight in old institutions. So we fight for workers having more influence, for a changed distribution of income, and so on. And 
in time, we win a new, we win a new society. If we can't, I hate to say this to you, but your future is very dismal. Uh, if we can't uh, win a new society, if we can't win a new kind of economy, if we can't change the, the ways in which society is organized and determines the distribution of benefits and debits and, and uh, influence, if we can't do those things, well, I think you probably at some level know what that would mean. You know what it would mean in terms of the ecology and climate. You know what it, mean, it would mean in terms of inequality and growing hostilities. Uh, and so that's, and I feel the same way. And that's why I concern myself with this question of trying to find a uh, worthy vision to organize our activity and to orient our activity. Let me take another person. Uh, Aslak, is that your name? I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Uh, that's okay. Um, okay, I, I would like to continue a bit on the question on a proposed of solutions. Uh, firstly, I think in the long term, uh, I'm really optimistic that this utopia can actually be reached through technology, allowing us to organize uh, our society better and so on. Um, but I live in Norway and I, I think that capitalism here has mainly been staggered by unions. Sorry, wait, you think capitalism? I didn't get the... Uh, I think that the unions in Norway, worker unions, uh, ha have uh, helped really stagger yeah. capitalism's consequences in, for example, comparison to the USA. And so I was yeah. wondering uh, whether you think that unions can be a sort of first step for most countries in the world towards yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if we discuss fully what we're talking about, if we're talking about working people controlling their own lives in their communities and in workplaces, and if we're talking about eliminating those class distinctions, then workers become pivotally important, not only important, but pivotally important. And if we were talking about kinship and we were talking about community, there would be you know, constituencies uh, of women and race and so on, who would also be profoundly important. But yeah, insofar as workers are really important, unions are important, and you're right in describing it as, um, or at least in my view, you're right in describing it as unions essentially uh, mitigate some of the ills of capitalism. Free, untrammeled capitalism is a total horror show. Right, it's kids working in those mines. It's 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 even worse than what we have, and part of the uh, bargaining power that puts a lid on how bad it gets is effective unions. And part of what's wrong in the United States now is the weakness of the labor movement, um, uh, and that's going to have to be rectified. So yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Alan, I'm sorry, I leaned forward when I look at the names. It's because they're really small and I can't read them unless I read phone. Uh, um, yeah, Alan. So first of all, um, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I mean, now for my question, if I understood you correctly by what you mean in participatory allocation or economics or whatever, um, I fear that we will have the problem of markets just like one level up. So, for example, in this negotiation that you described between different councils, of course, there will be more powerful councils. For example, I don't know, a food factory will have more influence than a bicycle factory because when the food factory goes on strike, um, people can't eat. Um, so I fear that we will have a market just between councils and all the problems that come with it will just be like, instead of individuals, we will have councils negotiating prices and, uh, and bargaining. So yeah. if you could address that. Yeah, I mean, the thing that you have to take into account is that it is an entirely new system. And so in the same way as you don't think now 
in Norway about owning a slave, right? It just doesn't come up. Right? It's not something that people are thinking about. Why is that? Well, it's because the institutions have changed in such a way that that doesn't exist. In a participatory economy, it would take time to, it's a good question, it would take time to uh, uh, develop. But the idea is that there's, there's no such thing as uh, using bargaining power to get income. Now, you, you're right, you, you could say if people remain motivated to violate and to aggrandize self in a context where your income is equitable and you have appropriate say, you have self-managing say, and you have um, uh, you know, everything else like healthcare and all that is free and so on. If in that context, the employees of, I don't know, a hospital decided to try and uh, violate the whole system and withhold their labor unless they were paid more, right? That's what you're suggesting. But that's not the way the, the, the economy works. And such people would be doing something that was like tantamount to behave to crime. It would be tantamount to behaving in a totally antisocial manner. And it's not the case that everybody would have to give in. It's quite the opposite, right? Uh, the, the society would just say, well, that's, I mean, it's hard for me to answer because I can't conceive of it happening once there's an established society. In an interim situation, it's much more realistic, right? So in an interim situation where you're making a transition uh, if the oil industry is predominant in Venezuela, the oil workers are very powerful. That's your, your instance, right? And the workers who are actually in the food industry are not powerful. It's the opposite of what you were suggesting, but that's actually the more real formulation. Um, and then there has to be constraints during the transition. But once a new economy is established, the, the, the violation that you're describing is tantamount to, you know, it, it's, it's tantamount to saying right now that everybody in some industry decides to go out and buy guns and rob the rest of the society. Now, that doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? It's because it's, you know, it's just people don't collectively function like that because people are not in large groups that vile. I mean, I think that's a rough answer unless we get much more specific. Um, uh, uh, somebody. Tibet. Yeah. Um, thank you for the lecture. I got uh, several questions, but um, they're all small questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how can we uh, conceive the concept of uh, rights uh, in the a new utopian society, because we were deriving the concept of right uh, from the private property. First of all, our private property of our own bodies and then our own houses, and we extend our liberty in its negative uh, sense, and then uh, we have uh, different rights uh, which are uh, protected uh, by the government. Uh, and uh, what will be, uh, how can we define the rights in okay. our in society? And, Secondly, should I, uh, Let me do that one and then I'll, I'll give you another, you can do another one, okay? Um, I think at least at the moment you're talking about property rights and the, the, one of the rights that we're talking about is the right to have a say over the decisions that affect you. And that conflicts with some kinds of property rights. It doesn't conflict with you owning the short that you're wearing, right? That doesn't impose any violation of self-management on others. But if you own a workplace, right, and you have dominion over the workplace, that does restrict the self-management of others. So that's one part of the answer. Another part of the answer is that it's, it's one thing to say you own the shirt that you got from the social product by virtue of spending some of your income on it. Right. It's another thing to say you own uh, tractors 
and you own essentially workplaces and you own technology, these things and natural resources, you own natural resources. These things are either the product of nature, right? Basically the sun for the most part, uh, food, natural resources uh, and the like, or they're a product of not decades, but hundreds of years of human interactions. So technology, right? They're a product of civilization. They're a product of the human experience. And the notion of participatory economics is that those kinds of things, whether it's natural productive assets or it's built as in by humans productive assets, uh, those things are common, are part of a commons. And when I in a workplace or when we as a workplace say, we would like to use some steel, some rubber, some, you know, some equipment, et cetera, uh, to make bicycles or whatever it happens to be, we're really saying to society, we want to borrow from the commons these inputs, right? To utilize on behalf of the social good. And if we are utilizing them on behalf of the social good, that's a sensible decision to make that we should do that. But what we're not doing is owning them and accruing profits based on them and having control over them. Now, other kinds of rights, like my ownership of my shirt or my computer or whatever, right? Those rights exist. Um, a right to have say over your life exists. A right to have an equitable income exists. These are the kinds of rights that exist in this kind of approach. Not, you know, a right to private property and and workplaces, not a right to um, have millions of dollars, not a right to trample over other people's rights, etc. Okay, thank you. So rights still exist, it's just different. Yeah. Right? And uh, secondly, it's also related with it, um, um, you have uh, talked, um, uh, are we imagining uh, our new utopian uh, socialist or anarchist uh, society? Um, as um, just capitalism uh, without um, any surplus value or uh, just a redistribution of the income between workers um, and um, which uh, at the, in, in the past they were giving the exploiters uh, their uh, surplus value and then uh, we will uh, redistribute it. And, and I think that it's also an obscure uh, thing because um, in the theory we see the surplus value, we can, we can uh, formulate and also calculate it. But in practice, um, the uh, things um, became all messed up uh, because um, economics uh, has so many components and so on. Because um, how can we, uh, are we seeing only a, a quantitative change or do we also, will we also need a, a qualitative change? I, I apologize, I'm having trouble understanding. It's my fault, uh, I just, I don't handle accents really well and I have trouble understanding, but I think ultimately what you're asking is what went wrong with uh, other efforts to be, to, to institute a post-capitalist arrangement. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think a few things went wrong and, and uh, those of you who, I think this was in your question, um, uh, there have been historically various post-capitalist or anti-capitalist, let's call it, um, projects, uh, uh, typically called socialist, sometimes anarchist, um, typically either market socialist or centrally planned socialist, market socialist in Yugoslavia, centrally planned socialist in the Soviet Union and a number of other places. Partly what went wrong with these projects, in my view, is that uh, they, they had very limited, relative to what I'm talking about, aims. They maintained the old division of labor. If you look in the old Soviet Union and the various, the old division of labor doesn't change. There's still empowered and disempowered workers. So they maintained the old class division. They got rid of owners at the top. That was a change, significant change. But they kept the the empowered class dominating 
the working class or the people who were left doing the onerous work. And the solution to that is to, in a sense, get rid of both. That is, share the empowered work. So you now have uh, all the workers all comparably empowered. And what we had in these countries and still have is a class division out with the old boss in with the new boss. And it was better in some respects and it was worse in other respects, especially in the cases where that had a political dictatorship along with it. Uh, and so what we're talking about, what, what I believe, some people have taken to calling those kinds of projects, right? 20th century socialism. Uh, I think that's misleading, or at least it's not very communicative. To me, those projects had a coordinator economy. They had it like the capitalist economy is headed by the capitalist class, coordinator economy is dominated by the coordinator class, the empowered workforce. And that's what I think was fundamentally wrong. But remember, they had either central planning or markets, which I rejected. They had the old division of labor, which I rejected. They had, and it's interesting, if you look at their constitutions, they had workers' councils. And they said all power resides in the workers' councils. But it was just paper. It didn't mean anything. In practice, the institutions conveyed the power to the empowered workers. And so the constitution might have said that, but the structure didn't say that. Just like in the United States, the Constitution and the rhetoric says that the population, you know, is in command. Well, that's nonsense. Population is not in command, right? The, the rich and powered uh, owners and the highly uh, uh, situated political figures are in command, uh, overwhelmingly. Anyway, um, uh, I'm looking for Jerry. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for the lecture. Um, you talked a lot about uh, self-managing and democratization of the, uh, in the economics. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know what that would mean for our educational system, especially for high schools and Good colleges, question. because in our current system, democracy or the concept of self-managing is near to non-exist. Is near to uh, non-existent. Yeah, it, it, it's good. Another good question. The I believe that while there are many details, the essence of understanding education, let's say in a country like the United States, um, and probably all the countries that you're from, is is explained overwhelmingly in terms of you educate the next generation and you want that generation, and this is understandably the case, you want that generation to fit the slots, the roles that society has. If they don't fit, well then they're misfits and they're either gonna be very angry or these roles are not gonna be fulfilled. And so, what does this tell us? I'm going to tell you one more story. In the 1960s, I suppose you have some awareness of that from history and from media and so on. Much of the awareness is perverse from historians and media, but nonetheless, we know that uh, there was this tremendous upsurge. And indeed there was. And after the 60s in the United States, the government set up something called the Carnegie Commission. And this has very much to do with your, with your question. The Carnegie Commission was empowered to try and understand what went wrong. From their point of view, of course, something went wrong, right? The, the society in the United States and in much, many, many other places in the world and throughout Europe, uh, the society was in turmoil and uh, the old ways were threatened. And this was deemed to be a horrible situation. And so the, the uh, Carnegie Commission was empowered to try and figure out, well, what went wrong? Why did, why did this happen? What do we have to do to prevent it from happening again? And the Carnegie Commission actually came up with a result, which was quite fascinating, I think. And the result was, they said, the problem was, 
We were over-educating people. The problem was, and it was spawned um, oddly enough by Sputnik and the, the competition, um, it led to this tremendous uh, flurry of interest in education and expansion of education. And the formulation of the Carnegie Commission was um, the, the, uh, the incoming workforce, the graduating classes that were coming into the economy, thought that they were going to have a life. They thought that they were going to have a degree of control. They thought that they were going to have a degree of dignity and of participation. And when they encountered the reality of, of life in the United States, um, you saw the explosion of the hippie culture and the resistance and the political dissent. And the most interesting thing about the Carnegie Commission's report was the solution. The solution was to stop over-educating people. The solution, and this is the answer to your question about education, right? The solution was to cut back education, to allocate funds to education in such a way that while a subset of young people were being given confidence and information and skills, most were not. Most were essentially uh, taught to endure boredom and take orders. That was the essence of the public school system, the essential element of it. What you got punished for was being uppity, not taking orders. You didn't get punished for getting a bad grade. That wasn't a punishment. What was the real thing that you had to keep under control was having a mind of your own and, and you know, exerting yourself, except in the honors classes where it was okay to be a little bit little bit out. Um, and so the answer to your question is the change is that we go from the corporate division of labor in which 80% of the incoming population, in other words, the people who are being educated, right? 80% have to be prepared and willing, if not eager, at least willing to put up with the circumstances of being disempowered and 20% have to be prepared to be masters of the universe. And if you change to balanced job complexes, it's, it's immediately the case that the educational system now has to do the opposite. It has to train everybody to prepare everybody, to free everybody, literally, to express themselves and to have initiative and to participate and to you know, have the kind of background overall knowledge. So one of you might have said, and I think it's important to raise, one of you might have said, yeah, but look, some people are just stupid. Um, and in fact, 80% are stupid. Now, maybe none of you would say this, but lots of people believe it. So lots of people believe, look, the reason why we have 20% making, doing all the decision making and running things, and we have 80% basically following orders is because that's all the 80% are capable of. And if that was true, what I'm proposing would be insane. It would be like proposing the trees fly, right? Not, not very smart. So if it's true that 80% are incapable, then what I'm proposing is absurd. And how do I answer this? Well, it's hard to prove something, but here's the way I try to answer it. Think back 60 years. Think of a stadium, a really large stadium. Put in the stadium all the surgeons in society, all of them, right? What do you notice about the stadium? What stands out and strikes you about what you see when you look in that stadium? Right, I, I would imagine that most of you are on, would say in a more interactive situation, well, it's almost all men. It's almost all white. And you'd be right on both counts. And not only that, those individuals, those white and male individuals, if asked why it was overwhelmingly white and male, would say, because women can't do it, because blacks can't do it. That's all. That's the reason. 
And uh, amazingly, if you asked women and blacks outside the stadium, a great many of them would say or would feel at some level the same thing. And the reality was, of course, we now know that it was a gigantic lie. It wasn't the case. We know now because we can see it in reality that it wasn't the case. In the United States, I think it's 51% of all med school students are women, right? And over the proportion of blacks in the society, I think it's, I don't know, it's like 12, 13%, more than that are in the med schools. So, so we know it's not an inability to, to do the activity. It is instead a structure and a system which says to people virtually from when they're born, what they can and can't accomplish, and which then provides them with, with resources and with training consistent with what society needs and wants from them. And from 80%, it wants obedience. And so that's, so the answer to the question is that um, it's a desirable attribute, I guess you could say, of participatory economics that it implies and requires, it depends on, transforming the educational system as well. Uh, because if you don't transform the educational system, well, then you have you know, people entering who are unprepared to participate, and that would be a problem. It would be the kind of reverse of the problem that existed in 1966 to 72, whatever, um, which was people coming in who thought they were going to control their own lives and who ran into capitalist role structures and immediately burst into indignation. In some cases, it was the hippie movement and the back to the earth movement and the, um, you know, that kind of phenomenon. And in other cases, like myself, it was a political resistance uh, which existed. Okay, let's, uh, is there a woman whose hand's up? I can't even. No? This would not happen in the United States now. Okay, uh, Shreyas, is that how you pronounce your name? Yep. Okay. Uh, hello. So I really enjoyed the lecture and my question is essentially this. First, like I'd like to ask for a clarification if I understand the argument, right? And then a quick follow-up question to that. Um, so my question is, if I'm not wrong, in participatory economics, the argument is that like you will, like the workers will be compensated based on their effort and wait, can you hear me clearly? Am I audible? But on their effort and what? Their effort and productivity as opposed to their skills and privilege. Is that yeah, true? call it effort and sacrifice. Effort and sacrifice, right? At at socially valued labor. At socially valued labor. Okay. That's very important. We'll see why in a minute, I'll bet from your question. Go ahead. Okay. So my question is like, the, at least my critique of capitalism is that when you pay workers based on um, their, their skills, that's a lot of times, you know, because of privilege and that's morally arbitrary, yeah. you have parents who can afford to send you to good schools and all of that, right? But my question is in a more subtle way, doesn't that kind of morally arbitrary privilege also apply to like the capacity to work harder and put more effort and sacrifice? Like, don't you think that the capacity to make like socially valuable labor and to like, you know, risk more if you have like, you know, family yeah. members at home or put more effort is also privileged in that sense? It's a good question. Again, assume we're a workplace. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the thrust of the question is, I think, that some of us might, let, let me make it even more explicit, some of us might not only sort of be able to, but might like hard work more, right? Uh, and be inclined to do it. And so we want to work more hours, right? And because after all, we get more income for it too, because it's duration. And you're right. Uh, a person who participatory economics does not equalize happiness per se. It does not equalize 
fulfillment per se. That's going to be another step, right? Uh, it it makes equitable distribution of uh, income, and it remunerates duration, intensity, and onerousness. But if you're, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose if you if you get pleasure out of pain, you do the onerous work and you get more income for it, right? That would be the extreme version of what you're asking. And yeah, I, you'd, you'd have an advantage. I don't think this is a, is a very widespread social problem. And if it was in a workplace, well, the workplace could just not apportion that activity to that worker. So in other words, in think... our workplace, when I say I want to work more hours, because I'm a friggin' maniac, when I say I want to work more hours, that's taking some time away from others, right? So you can't just willy-nilly do it. You can't just willy-nilly decide to, to work more hours. It's, it's a social determination on your work team or in the whole workplace. But you're right. Some people will... It's also how you choose work. So a balanced job... We didn't spend much time on a balanced job complex. So I can't understand why there wasn't more criticism of that. But um, if we have a balanced job complex and the job, let's say it's in the hospital. And so we're combining tasks in the hospital into jobs. If I can't stand dust, but don't mind moving boxes, say, I'm gonna opt for a job which has as one of its rote components moving boxes and not sweeping the floor, right? So we're trying, each of us is trying to get a circumstance that we like, right? But the, the large, and some of us will like things more than others because of, I don't know, genetics or whatever. But um, the large scale differences, those are gone. And the exploitation of differences are, that's gone too. Uh, and so, yeah. So, so, go ahead, you had a second half? Oh, uh, right, so just to follow oh, up where that. you went. <laughs> oh, I'm still here. Oh, okay, um, we're over there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so my follow-up to that would be, so I don't think it's just like wanting to do more hard work, but for example, let's say I'm like, because of my genetics, a physically stronger person, and I can uh, afford to like work harder and get more money, but that's no, also like, you know, morally arbitrary. No, and I agree with you. And that's why what it says is remunerate duration, intensity, and onerous, but not output. So suppose I'm six foot three, 220 pounds and built like an ox, right? And you're, and I don't know, so this is not a comment, but you know, you're 5'10", or switch it because it would be me. You're 5'10", and much lighter and physically weaker. And we both go into the field to cut sugar cane, right? Let's just say, Cuban example. So we both go into the field to cut sugar cane. Now, obviously I can cut more cane than you, right? Because I'm physically stronger. And some people would say, in fact, many socialists would say, okay, I should get more income for that because I should get income for my output, for, the, for what I contribute to the social product by my effort, right? Let's say we both go into the field and you've got a better tool than I do, right? So you've got some kind of a, of a really good tool for cutting sugar cane and I have friggin' pocket knife, right? So now you can... can amass the larger amount of stuff, right? And I don't think either one of those people, the one with the better equipment, or the one who's physically bigger and stronger, should receive income for that. Why? Because I don't want to reward luck. It's luck in the genetic endowment, right? You didn't do anything to become Michael Jordan, right? Or, or Exactly. Right? You didn't do it. Noam Chomsky didn't do anything to, to, to get his brain. He didn't work hard to get it. It's just luck in the genetic lottery, right? Okay. And I don't think we should reward that. We shouldn't shower benefit on top of luck already, right? Then, Adele would... doesn't get income because she has a great voice, right? And so on and so forth. And the same thing for physical size. When you say that somebody might enjoy working longer more than somebody else well what you're saying is somebody enjoys working longer but then they have less leisure mm -hmm. right 
So you can think of it that way too. You can think of each person as having a combination of leisure and work. So and now you... we're equalizing. Now we're saying the, the work leisure combination that we each have, right? Should be comparable to the work leisure that other people have. So in other words, you get more work, you get less leisure, you get more leisure, you get et cetera. But at any rate, don't, there is no, in participatory economics, there's no remuneration for output. But, all right, let me, we're making a lot of, you know, we're covering a lot of ground, and that's good. Um, Suppose Joe says, well, this is pretty interesting. What I'm going to do is go in my backyard and dig holes, and I'm going to fill them in. And I'm going to have my daughter use the hose and shoot water at me while I'm doing it. And I'm going to do it for a lot of hours, right? So I'm going to work long, hard, and under horrible conditions, and I want payment for it. Joe gets nothing. He gets nothing because it's not socially valued labor, right? So that's the crucial last ingredient for duration, intensity, and onerous, but of socially valued labor. You're not getting it for the amount of output that's valued, but you have to be doing output that's valued. And, the, and another reason for that is, suppose we're a workplace and we've got lots of equipment that we're using. And suppose we're underutilizing it, right? We're just not, we're not working effectively with all that equipment, which could be put to other purposes. And it would be much better for society if it was. Well, we need our allocation system to discover that. And we need our allocation system to say, wait a second, you don't get to misuse all this equipment that's part of society's commons. You're not using it effectively to create socially valued output. Right? And that's another way in which this part of the norm comes into play. Um. If I could just also like finally I asked for you. Okay. Yes, last. Um, isn't a lot of so I get now that participatory economics will account for all of this privilege and like difference in abilities and preferences. But given that a lot of these differences in abilities and preferences are so subtle, how do you exactly would you calculate this when you were doing your remuneration? How do you so you're asking how you measure basically? Exactly. Okay. So imagine we're a workplace, right? Um Duration is easy, right? Right. Duration yeah. is easy. Um, is it socially valuable or not? Well, you know, if I'm, if I say I'm working three more hours than everybody else and I asked to do it, but actually I'm sitting there and twiddling my thumbs, you all know it. And you don't want your, a piece of the income to go to me for that. Right. And it's easily discernible, right? Far easier than discerning the contribution that people make to output now. Um, uh, what about uh, onerousness? Well, you know, it's a, it's a decision by the workers' council, right? And it doesn't mean how onerous do, does the individual find the activity. So in other words, if there's activity that's onerous and I like it, well, I should opt for it, right? And that's to my benefit, right? But it, it's how onerous it is in the eyes of the workplace for the workforce, you know, for all workers. And intensity, um, can you measure that perfectly? No, you can't measure anything perfectly in a social situation. But can you measure it satisfactorily from the point of view of everybody who's participating, feeling that the outcome is just and equitable? Yeah, that's not that hard, right? Uh, it's a bigger question to explain. And, I'm not going to do it now, I don't think, to explain how it is that participatory planning, right, allots to each workplace a kind of a payroll, right, shares on output, income, which is, income is just, okay, I get a certain income that gives me shares on the output from society, right? So how does it allocate to each workplace the appropriate amount for the workplace? How does it allocate less if the workplace really isn't doing any work? How does it allocate more if it's doing more and so on? That question we're gonna leave aside for now. And let me give you a plug. Um, I mean, there's lots of literature about participatory economics. If you look it up online, you'll see all sorts of 
literature and debates and books and so on. Um, and I, I teach an online course. So if you look up sscc.teachable.com, it's a school that I and others have put together. And it isn't only about participatory economics. There's various kinds of classes. For instance, Chomsky teaches a course in it. So it's online and, it's, and it has various courses. And, uh, you know, you might find something you want to take. And who knows, maybe you'll even want to take a participatory economics course. Okay, so enough of that. Um, uh, Hendrik? Yes, uh, I have a question um, that about how would your idea of a fair economy transferred on an international level? So let's say the United States are able to establish the new economy that you're proposing, then the system would be more fair on a national level, yet the US United States will still be a big controller of the global market and also using, let's say, smaller countries for their benefit. So does your proposal require mm -hmm. a global system or would it okay. work? So you could, uh, one possibility, which is not pleasant, right, is that let's say the United States changed to a participatory economy and it still behaves as a vile thug internationally, which maybe you don't quite acknowledge that that's what my country does, but it is exactly what my country does. And it's a much understated formulation of what my country does. But in any event, I don't think that's realistic. I don't think it's realistic that the United States would uh, be transformed in the way that we're describing, and then would try and exploit the world, uh, basically, uh, because I don't think the population would have any part in that. But maybe it would require movements to push the issue. But what should be the norm is a different way of asking your question. And I think it would be something like this. You can't equalize everything overnight. I mean, that's just true. You can't. And in fact, sometimes trying to do that can introduce new problems. But just like you can't have balanced job complexes throughout the hospital overnight, you can't do that overnight. The people who are doing rote work can't do surgery tomorrow, right? So it takes time to balance job complexes and to do various things. But internationally, I would assume it would be something like this. If two countries are engaging in exchange and internationally, we don't yet have participatory planning, we still have international markets, right? Then the country that is wealthier, right? The country that has a higher standard of living and is better off economically, should in fact um, share the benefits of the transaction such that the country that's worse off gets more. What we have right now is the exact opposite. And it's gonna be hard to believe, but what we have right now is that in the international market system, the country that is better off is also stronger, is also in a better position, bargaining power arise to negotiate in international markets and to force outcomes in international markets. So when exchange takes place, the reason exchange takes place is because there's enough benefits to warrant the exchange, right? I have apples, you want to eat, I give you apples, you give me some money, right? The benefit effects has benefits, and the benefits are shared by the participants. But the benefits can accrue mostly to one party or the other. And now what happens is that the benefits accrue mostly to the stronger party. And what should happen at a minimum, right, is that the benefits should accrue more to the weaker party. So as to over time, narrow those gaps, right? So that would be my rough answer and in details, it would, you know, get more details. So um, you need an international set of rules that will allow this to happen or? How would you? <laughs> are, are you asking? I'm not sure what you're asking. If you're asking if what, where are you from? Uh, I'm 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 from Germany. Germ as, well, that's. Not, Germany. I was hoping you were going to be from a, a little bit uh, less powerful country, but even well, Germany. I'm representing Denmark, but I'm currently staying. Okay, <laughs> but e even Germany, if German um, political dynamics um, were to unfold in coming years rapidly 
and move toward this kind the, the kinds of things we've been talking about. So there were wide popular movements in Germany that were beginning to transform workplaces and beginning to take them over and so on and so forth, and beginning to transform other parts of German society, the political system and the culture and so on. Uh, that would be a gigantic threat to those countries, to, to, to those elites who don't want to see those kinds of changes in their own country, right? And so in particular, the United States would find that quite threatening. How do we know that? Well, we know that because we've seen it. Much less threatening things, like for instance, the Cuban revolution, which was a far cry from what we're talking about, right? Or Vietnam's desire to extricate itself from the international market system, much lesser things cause the United States to go ballistic and to rain death upon people. And so in France in 1968, when the French uprising, you should read about it, um, happened, and when uh, France was in the throes of a gigantic, quite tumultuous upheaval of social activism and involvement, still a far cry from what we're talking about here, but nonetheless, very dangerous from the point of view of, say, the United States. Why? It's the threat of a good example, right? The, the old formulation was that, well, the United States gets upset by the spread of communism and by, you know, the United, Russians taking over the world or Chinese taking over the world. Okay, that has nothing to do with anything. It's, it, it, it's as close to, you know, international silliness as you can get in many respects. But there is the threat of a good example. So the danger that Vietnam would establish itself as a model, right? To, that, that revealed to the people of other countries, not their elites, but to the people of other countries, the benefit of resisting and of creating a transformation in their country, or that Cuba does that. That, um, that threat of a good example is what mobilizes American imperialism to exert itself. Um, and so I think one question that you might be asking is what allows countries to embark on this kind of transformation? And the answer is very powerful internal movements. And you're saying there needs to be some kind of external dynamic also. Why? So that the United States doesn't crush them, right? Or some other country doesn't crush them. And you're right. That's a sad reality of the current world. Um, I will I, just jump in briefly and say that maybe we should slowly wrap it up. Not because it wouldn't be interesting, but because we need to make sure that students get some rest before the <laughs> uh, important day tomorrow when they're writing the essays. So maybe, Michael, if you take one or two questions and, and slowly wrap it up, I would appreciate that. Okay, it's up to you. Uh, um, uh, so you should ask because you know the people. So maybe, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Is it Wiki? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I found your lecture, lecture really interesting. Um, and I, um, I was just wondering, I'm very interested in uh, the educational system. Mm -hmm. um, how are you uh, intending to like get kids ready to be the self-managing and uh, confident people? Yeah, see, I don't, I actually think that the, but the question's a good one, but I would put it a little differently. How do you stop preventing kids from doing that, right? That is, kids naturally have an inclination to be inquisitive, to be, involved i mean if they're if they're free and if they are nurtured and 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 um you know supported i think they have a natural inclination maybe if you don't but by and large that's the case what's what education as in vast public education has to do is stamp that out of lots of people right that's what so you have to stop stamping it out is the real the real step, right? Then 
It's pretty, I mean, you know, people who have talked about education have, have written about what does free education look like? What does it look like to um, produce in people the inclination to think rather than the inclination to parrot what somebody says to them and so on and so forth? I think you know the answers. Um, the, the, but the real thing to notice is not that kids are inadequate, but that the educational system crushes us. Yes, no, I don't think they're inadequate. I just think um, other kids might have uh, the impact on each other, not knowing um, when you are an adult, not that I'm an adult, but <laughs> when you're grown up, uh, the way you interact with each other and the way you self-manage and communicate. I, mm, I think there might happen things in schools that happen in society now, just on a tinier scale. I'm not sure I'm understanding. I, I, I think there would be different, pedagogy would be different. I mean, if that's what you're mm -hmm. asking. Um, what people do in early grades and then in later grades, like high school, where you guys are, I guess, um, would, be, would be quite different. Um, and, you know, I would think that uh, teachers and uh, becoming liberated, becoming politicized, becoming radical, would start to demand changes. This was happening in the 60s, and it would happen again. Um, you know, I, I, I am, that's not me. Um, the way I try and do it is by trying to induce people to think, by trying to support people when they do think, by trying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes. It's just natural. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so no problem there. Hmm? So no problem there. I don't think so. I, I think a, a different form of the question would be, um, Michael, you're saying that all surgeons now, right, are no longer going to do only surgery. They're going to do a balanced job complex. So all surgeons now are going to do some surgery, but they're also going to clean some bedpans or whatever they're going to do that balances out their job complex. And the same person would then say, Michael, you're saying we should lose the productive capacity, a lot of the productive capacity of current surgeons, right? Because they're not only doing surgery, they're doing other things. And that's true. That's correct. And the claim is that the 80% who are doing rote and repetitive and obedient work have in them, amongst them, in total, more than enough capacity to make up for that loss, right? That's the crucial step. Um, and if you don't believe that, like people once believed that, you know, women couldn't become surgeons or blacks couldn't become surgeons, um, then, you, then you think that the proposal for balanced job complexes is ethically nice, right? But it would so reduce productivity and output that it would be a disaster right and some people will think that margaret thatcher would say that right? i don't believe that for a minute um not at all i also think even well i'll leave it at that um somebody have a uh, i see there are some i see that the, in the chat there are i'm going to give you my email address and the people who are putting questions in the chat, maybe because they didn't want to speak up, um, you can send them to me and I will reply. Okay, I promise. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try and address concerns that you have or questions that you have. It's SYSOP, S-Y-S-O-P. That's from system operator in the old days. S-Y-S-O-P at Z-M-A-G dot O-R-G. And if, you know, if you had questions that weren't addressed and you, you know, you really want to have them addressed, send them to me. That's fine. I don't mind. And it helps me too, because I see what, what concerns people have. Um, and then if you really want to get into it, you could try that course that I told you about. 
does one more person have a desperation question that they really want to ask right now? I've got, look at you still got your hand up. Uh, Leon? Okay, thanks for the opportunity. And my question is uh, the following. Although you didn't mention it literally, but I suppose being part of your system, it goes with consent. But what if I- Wait, or wait, I, I didn't hear that. The, the what of your system? Being part of your system goes oh. with consent. This is what I suppose, right? And, but what if you or I just don't want to be part of your social contract or of your system? And how do you think can your system or uh, applied in a company or a region or in a, on a national scale really survive market wise if I just or another person immigrate to a capitalist country and do just a normal work because in your system you have a loss of efficiency and yeah I think the same we mentioned it before you just uh, need the revolution on the on an international scale to see really an, an success of your system so what i'm really aware of oh, what i'm afraid of is the fact that people could be forced to be part of your system and right. i'm not sure if i can really like this idea of be uh, of not being able to opt out of it, you know? Not being able to opt out of it, I see. Um, well, first off, um, in, in the current world, right, we are all confronted with a set of roles that are exist in society. So if I wanna have a balanced job complex, I basically can't, right? I, only in some, some small institutions that establish that. But by and large, what we're presented with is a certain kind of job structure and we have to choose among that or opt out uh, in in a participatory economy you're correct that if we want to participate in the economy the only jobs that are available are balanced jobs that's what's available in a participatory economy and so we can't say well i want to do only empowered work it's not an option because the jobs don't exist, right? Now, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, I think it's a good thing. And I don't think it would be too much of a hardship, but I, here's where I agree with you. I think in the short run and in the midterm, in other words, in the transition from one society to another, uh, it is a problem. And that there's a large number or a considerable number of, we've been using doctors as the example, doctors or lawyers or engineers and so on, who would say, good Lord, you want me to do disempowering work? Forget it. I refuse, right? And as the society changes, their refusal means stepping outside the system, right? Or else, I mean, because they either participate or they don't. Uh, there's those other kinds of jobs don't exist. And I'll give you a very concrete example of this happening. After the Cuban Revolution, which again did not set up what we're talking about, it set up something more like a coordinator class run economy um, and a polity that was rather centralized. Uh, so it's far from what I am talking about, but it was very different from what was there before. And doctors, by and large, not all of them, but a large number of doctors split for the United States quickly, because they said to themselves, I can earn more in America, and I can be better off in America, because after all, in Cuba, I'm going to, my, my income is going to become more equitable, which it did. Some stayed because they wanted to be part of the social transformation. So that's a choice that people made. Now, interestingly enough, in Cuba, the number of doctors steadily rose after that, because they were changing the educational system to graduate more doctors. And actually, Cuban healthcare is rather exemplary in the world, not just not just for a poor third world country now. Um, so the the 
the possible trajectory into something better was there, but you're right, some people resisted it. And in the case of Cuba, they could just leave and go to the United States. In the United States, it would be a little trickier. Um, they'd probably resist the change and fight against it for a considerable time. And then eventually, there's no more fighting against it. Just like slave owners fought against the abolition of slavery. Just like right now, the heads of pharmaceutical companies, right, in order to profit more and to maintain their relative status and power are fighting against making vaccines available throughout the world. If you think about that, it is mind boggling, right? These highly civilized and uh, you know, impressive bastions of, of leadership in the United States are committing mass murder literally committing mass murder. And that's, that's the reality. And that's a, a social system producing people whose lives have been so twisted that that's all they can think of. That's, that's what they think they have to do to, to, you know, to express their, their selves. So the answer to your question is, is equity, uh, solidarity, self-management, diversity. Attaining those takes the place of getting materially ahead at the expense of others. And for those for whom it doesn't take the place of it, they're not going to be happy with the change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can finish here. I know there is a lot of things you could discuss, um, but I do think we need to um, force students to, um, to, to go to and get some rest before a very long day tomorrow. I thank Michael Arbe Albert for this uh, interesting um, uh, and controversial lecture that for sure uh, inspired quite some thoughts. And that was the idea to give you some food for thought um, to think about utopia from this perspective. We are going to open more perspectives with David Eslund and uh, Sebastian Mitchell later on in the weekend. Um, on Sunday and Saturday, you can also expect a lot of um, uh, philosophical cafes for uh, students. Um, tomorrow, we have a workshop. We have um, discussion with Peter Singer. In the evening, we have a discussion and lecture by Noam Chomsky. And during the day, obviously, uh, essay writing for students. And in between, when students are going to write the essays, um, teachers have some sessions only for teachers on some novelties and different approaches in teaching philosophy. And then we also have the international jury meetings. Um, all the emails with the uh, PDFs of tomorrow's program were already sent out. Um, so please check this and I hope to see many of you tomorrow. Uh, maybe to the students who are still with us, um, you also have received the email and you will receive the Zoom links and the codes for your essay writing tomorrow morning 9, 9 a.m. UTC plus two. So please don't panic uh, if you haven't received the codes or Zoom links. You are all receiving them tomorrow 9 a.m. immediately after we have a second technical meeting for students who did not attempt today's one, just so to troubleshoot any issues there. And then immediately we are sending this out. Once again, big, big thank to Michael, especially also for him being able, uh, being willing to share his contact. I did uh, share his email in the chat. I will send it Good. once again uh, over the email to all the participants. And I do encourage you to uh, contact our lecturer as well as to maybe check the book, Practical Utopia. Uh, for me, it was quite an interesting read. So thank you once again, Michael. Thank you everybody for being- Thank you for having us. me. It was our pleasure. I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of uh, uh, many people here. And to all the others, um, I hope to see you tomorrow. Mm, get some rest and get ready for your essay writing. Enjoy. So long, all. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much, Michael. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. You're all welcome.